Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to you all again into the classroom. I need not reiterate again and again that this is a very exciting subject that you've all chosen to study and I think it's a, a good decision. Over a period of time we have been talking about different methodologies about evaluating your investment decisions. We have talked about fundamental analysis, we've talked about technical analysis, and then we again talked about fundamental analysis and financial statements, and then we talked about investing. And recently we talked about investing alternatives, and then we talked about indirect investing, and I told you when you invest directly into the stock market is different than directly investing into the stock market through an intermediary or a mutual fund, which would be indirect investing. So either you could directly own shares of a company or indirectly own shares of a company, which would mean an intermediary is going to facilitate your buying and sellings into the equity market by way of a portfolio. We must understand what a portfolio is, what diversification is, what risk is. In generally speaking, we decided maybe go through the process of investing through a mutual fund and diversifying our portfolio, diversifying our investment, and spreading out our risk, which would mean minimizing losses, maximizing profits. So then we come on to the topic of investment companies, which are there to look after your investment decisions, your investment needs, your investment expectations. These investment companies or financial firms sell you shares, units, of the mutual fund and make you invest through them. They offer you professional management, the expertise that's required to maximize your profits. And then they facilitate your returns on investments by way of sending you the dividends or reinvesting the dividends as per your requirements. The company types would then incorporate different forms of companies and to begin with, we would talk about close-ended funds. Close-ended funds would be mutual funds with a fixed paid-up capital and a fixed authorized capital. And you have to work within the domain of the fixed capital. Or you could talk about open-ended mutual funds in which there is constant inflow and outflow of shares, buying and redemption of shares. There's no fixed paid up capital, it keeps changing constantly. This would be the open-ended fund in which net asset value after initial sale capitalizes the stock and the company. This keeps changing. Shares may be sold back to the company at net asset value. Now this is different than a closed-ended fund which is traded on the exchange. In an open-ended fund, which is not traded on the exchange, you shall, you, you shall be selling the shares back to the company. You can buy shares from the company, and then you can redeem them to the company. So this would be an open-ended fund. Now, there are a lot of categories in a mutual fund, and you would be talking about what? Like maybe a money market mutual fund in which they would invest purely onto the money market. We have talked that the money market is for the short term, and then these funds would be rotating every 90 days for investing into different, swapping over into different money market funds. For all this, investors have to pay a management fee. This is the source of income, not the only source of income, or one of the sources of income. We do understand that we have to pay service charges for services acquired by the investors. And in the mutual fund, you pay such a charge as well. You would be understandably investing into a particular fund, 
maybe we could talk about investing into the equities. Now, when we're talking about mutual funds, equity is probably the most likable form of investing and maybe not uh, bonds and income funds. But there is no stopping you into getting into a mutual fund that maybe invests into an income or a bond mutual fund. There's so many variations, but the objective is mostly to reap profits for the stakeholders or the unit holders. Whatever the case may be for a mutual fund to decide where to invest, the objectives have to be set by the management company's board on the outset. Before they take in the money, they have to decide what sort of a mutual fund they're getting into. It is for them to let the investors know what the mutual fund plans to do with the money that they're going to take. So most assets in equity funds are going to be focused on the shares and not bonds or income funds. In the mutual fund, in the equity fund, we could be talking about value funds and growth funds in which you would have either an exclusive value mutual fund or an exclusive growth mutual fund. And obviously, we would be talking about value stocks or growth stocks in the mutual fund exclusively or a blend of both. Where you would have quality stocks in the mutual fund with a history of good dividend payouts, or you would have growth funds with the future thought to be exciting. Now, there are cost considerations. We have talked about this a number of occasions that there are charges to be paid whenever you buy and sell shares or whenever you buy and sell units of a mutual fund. They would be called load charges. Load would be the same thing as service charges or a commission, but you have a front-end load and a back-end load. So when you redeem the units, that would be a charge you'd be paying at the back-end. And when you buy them from the investment company, you'd be charged in the term called a front-end charge. So this is the distribution charge fee that is charged buying and selling a unit with the company. These are the cost considerations that have to be kept in mind while you're calculating your profitabilities. Obviously, all this is written in black and white in the prospectuses. And once again, I do not need to emphasize the importance of understanding and reading such documents. You may not have to pay anything to the company at all once you get into a direct liaison with the company while they're being offered to you for sale in the initial public offering. So maybe you will not get any load charge for the first time. Obviously, since you're dealing directly and there's no sales force expenses to be covered. So you need to find out, the investors need to seek out such funds. But in annual operating expense, paid out of the fund income has to be shifted over to the asset management company. We need also to understand the performance of a mutual fund. And the report of the mutual fund's net asset value is given on a daily basis in the newspapers. These values let investors know that they've been investing into good mutual fund or not a good mutual fund. So you'll either have a discounted net asset value or a premium net asset value. And these total returns are decided over a period of time. Average annual return reflects the mean compound growth rate of investment over a period of time. Then only will we be able to understand the return on investments. What had we been paying initially for the mutual fund and what is going to be the value at the time of redemption? or the net asset value at the time or you redeem your shares. Now, there are a number of types of mutual funds. You could have local mutual funds, and you could have international mutual funds in which the stocks of international stock exchanges would be invested into. 
Or then again, you may be interested in a mutual fund that's focused on investments in the emerging market economies. Or maybe you would be interested in investing in continental mutual funds, focusing on one continent like Africa, Asia, Australia, Europe or America. But these would then be different. You may even opt for a single country concentrated mutual funds in which they would pick out maybe investing just in stocks related to the Pakistan stock market. You may invest into a company fund, a mutual fund, which would be actively traded or passively traded. Mostly, please keep in mind, mutual funds do not participate in active trading, but there's no barring them from cashing on to profits, but definitely a buy and hold strategy is appreciated. You could also be talking about exchange traded funds where you have a basket of stocks that tracks the value of a sector or investment style or market as a whole. In an exchange traded fund, the characteristics of the index mutual funds and close ended funds are looked at. So, exchange traded funds is something very interesting, and you trade throughout the day on the exchange. These exchange traded funds are traded on the exchange floor. You could have a bond index traded fund or an equity index traded funds on the exchange floor. We could maybe talk about a single index mutual fund, which would be a mutual fund of the particular stock exchanges index. We may have a mutual fund that would be based on the Karachi Stock Exchange index or a mutual fund based on the Lahore Stock Exchange Index, or a mutual fund based on the Islamabad Stock Exchange Index. The variation is infinite. It is for the company to decide what sort of mutual fund are they going to create for investors to invest in. And then it's also up to the investors to look at the jungle of mutual funds that suddenly cropped up and find out the best option for them. These mutual funds are going to give you a variation that you will not be able to do it on your own. Now, another way for me to put out a mutual fund is that you manage to invest into the asset management company's project and these little savings or these little investments collectively become a sea of investment. All these channelized investments, these rivulets, these rivers then become an ocean or a sea of investments which can be invested in a hugely successful, gainful way. Since bigger is better in the capital markets, an equity game which would tilt towards uh, bigger holdings, bigger investment potentials. Individual stakes into the mutual funds could give you rich harvest by way of a collective investment strategy. The mutual funds can be a beneficial way of you getting into the equity market. Now, mutual fund supermarkets is another interesting phenomenon that's coming up in which various mutual fund families can be purchased through a single source shall I say, something like a fund of funds, in which several funds units are put into one fund and then sold to you as a fund of funds. So this supermarket of funds, as the name goes, would mean one organization, one large financial family, taking out different mutual funds for different specific needs. So maybe in one supermarket, you would have a mutual fund focused on age, mutual fund focused on industry, mutual fund which would be aggressive in nature, mutual fund which would be based on value stocks, mutual fund based on growth stocks. Once again, it's infinite. And then these supermarket managers would earn fees on the different portfolios under their umbrella. Now, this again is not a bad idea, but it is up to the investor to identify oneself and screen the information that's being available to 
the investor. An investor would be an individual or an institution. Now, internet used to provide mutual fund information in market transactions make it more exciting. Since the times that old exchanges have transformed from physical stock exchanges into internet or computerized stock exchanges, facilitations are now there available for investors to participate with ease. Once again, the mutual fund is an alternative investment strategy for the early investor. For you to get a feel of the market, you will get a daily update on to the net asset value of your investment, maybe through direct information or maybe next day through the newspaper. These net asset values are calculated at the end of the day, called mark to market. At the closing bell, whatever the rate of one particular share is, that is all calculated and the combined value of the mutual fund unit is calculated. And on any given day, you would then have information whether you're doing well in the market or whether the mutual fund is not performing well. Now, obviously, all these activities have an impact on the market, negative or positive, pervasive and dominant. The single most important risk affecting the price movement of common stocks is the general condition of the economy, the general condition of the market, and obviously the specific nature of the stock in the portfolio. So these are particularly true for diversified portfolio of stocks. And this accounts for almost 90% of the variability. 90% of the variability in a diversified portfolio's return. Obviously, this is what I was talking about local stock, but generally investors buying foreign stock also face the same situation. The impact of the market, the impact on the market, and subsequently the impact on the mutual fund has to be faced by the investors, local and foreign. Please try to understand that mutual fund is very much a part of the capital market domain. So whatever is generally happening in the capital market is going to affect the mutual fund as well. However, while the impact of a single investment done by you in an individual stock is going to be very different than a portfolio, than a mutual fund, the consequences and results of your investments will vary. Having said that, it is needless to say that diversification saves you from any serious negative impact. But then it also depends on the nature of diversification. The diversification itself has to be definitely balanced out in a way to spread out the risk factors. So this is all about risk, return, trade-off. This is all about risk and gain. The more we spread out the portfolio, the more we spread out the risk, the more chances for us to gain more safely. Now, mutual funds give you all this excess because this is probably the best way to diversify your portfolios without you trying to get into such a situation without understanding equity markets. Equity markets is not a casino, it's not a gambling den. It is a financial institution which gives you handsome returns once you've done your homework well before investing. We do need to understand what our required rate of return is. We need to understand what is the minimum expected rate of return needed for such a gainful investment. Since this is all done over a passage of time, we must understand what the returns are going to be over a given period of time. Obviously, 
in the very first lecture, we did discuss that investing is risky, savings is not. So since this is all about risk, we must understand given the risk, a security must offer some minimum expected return to persuade purchase, to encourage purchase. Investors expect the risk-free rate as well as a risk premium to compensate for additional risk assumed. The risk premium is important, the time frame is important, and then only we will be encouraged to invest into the equities directly or through a mutual fund. Only then are we going to assume risk since we need to have an estimated expected required rate of return which has to be over and above inflation, over and above risk, over and above the premium that you're going to pay for getting into a risky business. And needless to say, we must understand the stock market is definitely not without risk. It is a risky business. Businesses generally are risky, but some may be less risky, some more. Stock market is a risky place. Stock market is a risky business and investing in stocks is risky, but even there is a comparison between risk and profit, then it can be considered not as risky as it sounds. The only bottom line is doing your homework to find out what best investments we can get into and what is our required rate of return. Everybody as an individual, everybody as an institution has its own required rates of return. Generally speaking, we always talk about investments in areas where we will be safe as far as inflation is concerned. For this purpose, a term comes up called beta. And this is specifically a measure of volatility of the stock or the volatility of the mutual fund. For making things clear, clarify what this is all about that I'm talking. We shall look at the screen that shows you the security market line. This graph tells you about the security market line and the betas. Take a good look at the graph and you'll find out that we take 1 as the standard of beta and 1 implies as risky as market, which means the 1 is the figure that we look at as the mean of the market. Now looking at the graph, looking at the screen, we understand that securities A and B are more risky than the market because beta is greater than 1. On the other hand, security C is less risky because beta is less than 1. So where you see securities A and B being more risky, with beta as being 1.5 and 2, security C being less risky, having beta of 0.5. Remember, 1 was the figure, the divisor, the baseline for understanding betas. And anything greater is more risky than the market mean. And anything less is good value to invest in compared to the market. Since we are always, always looking for our stocks, we are always, always looking for mutual funds which are undervalued, which are discounted compared to its earning per share, compared to its net asset value, beta plays an important role in finding out best value for money. So we try to find out companies with betas lesser than one. Now, the security market line for which purpose I showed you the, the, the slide and the graph, 
it's important for you to understand very simply what betas are. You must understand risk-free returns, which may be less, but will give you a lesser exposure to the risk of capital markets. Having said that, you cannot undermine that the risk is there in the stock markets for us to avoid or for us to face. We could either take that as a threat and try to minimize risks, or we can take that as an opportunity and try to maximize our profits by investing in the stock market of that particular share, having greater values or lesser values than the betas. Did I mention that beta is not the only factor that we look at? Obviously, we need to look at the discounted cash flow and what is going to be the risk premium that we are going to be offering for a stock to invest in right now. Since the risk premium reflects the uncertainty of investment into a particular stock or a particular mutual fund, we have to find out what are we going to get in return while we are going to pay the risk premium. This risk premium would include inflation. This would also include the interest that is going to be paid over a number of period of times if we've got investment through leverage or we maybe we've got a certain required rate of return to look at while investing into the stocks. And that is precisely what we need to understand to required rate of return. We do understand that if 10% is the inflation, our returns need to be greater than 10%. We need to understand that if we have been offered the best probable rate of return in another financial institution, let's say a bank at maybe 7% or 8%, we must understand what it's going to be worth one year down the road. So, we must understand whatever we are going to earn one year down the road has to be over and above inflation or expected inflation. So, real rate of return is basic exchange rate in the economy. The real rate of return is the inflationary impact included in the investment. If we're talking about passive stock strategies, the natural outcome of a belief in efficient markets, we'll be talking about efficient markets in a while, but there is no active strategy that should be able to beat the market or on a risk adjusted basis. It is very difficult to beat the market. The market is too big for an individual to out be outperformed, but we do understand and appreciate it that fund managers, portfolio managers, asset managers and individuals do outperform from the market. The emphasis is on minimizing transaction costs and time spent in managing the portfolio. And thereon, then expecting benefits from active trading or analysis less than the cost. Not what is all this talk about? Whether to have a passive stock strategy or an active stock strategy. The buzzword is active and passive. The more you trade, the more active you are in the market, the more risk prone you are, and the more costs you pay by way of buying and selling commissions or by, by way of load charges, whether back end or front end. The more activity you do, the more exposed you are to risk. So maybe, Active strategy doesn't work as well as passive strategy in mutual funds. Or in generally expected behavior, a passive strategy generally is more comfortable. I'm sure this intent is not going to be very appreciated by the brokerage community, but then we are talking about investments. An investment does include trading, but not by a large way. Investment generally means investing for the long term, and which would mean a buy and hold strategy. In a buy and hold strategy, we make our decisions more in line with our fundamental analysis 
of the mutual fund or the portfolio or the individual equity. And then we will look at the financial statements and make a decision to buy and hold because we would be talking about investing for the future, we're talking about gains in the future, we're talking about cash flows of the future and price earning multiples in future. By doing all these decisions, we understand that buy and hold strategy is a good passive stock investing strategy. Now, a buy and hold strategy would mean that active management will incur transaction costs if we trade too much. And generally, the more you trade, there is probability the more mistakes you will make. Like they say, it's not a good idea to be driving a public transport vehicle on the roads because the more on the roads, the more risk there is of an accident. Similarly, if you're in the capital markets, the more actively you participate into the markets, more exposed you are to the dangers and risk of capital market volatilities. So it is important what initial selections you have made, because that is going to be the key to success. If you made a good decision, you made a good initial investments, the need does not arise for you to make any active participation in the stock market. Due to this, certain functions have to be taken care of by reinvesting income and adjusting to changes in risk tolerance. The dividend reinvestment program precisely lets you take this decision of reinvesting into the mutual fund or the stock. But by making a good early decision, you save yourself from exposures of capital market uncertainties. Now, these uncertainties are going to make things more difficult for you. So it is best to make a good sensible decision before we invest in the first place. Looking at financial statements, looking at the balance sheets, looking at the cash flow statements, and helping yourself with some technical analysis as well, we will be able to reach a decision whereby investing would be sensible and we would not need to swap over positions again and again in our search for making better returns. So buy and hold strategy by and large is a passive stock strategy and has been found out to be the best strategy. Since we've been talking about stock markets, we've been talking about long-term investments. When we've been talking about long-term investments, it is understandable. You've got to buy and hold on to your investments. Now, when we are holding on to investments, we are actually saving up on costs. It's not just the buying and selling prices of the stocks or the mutual funds. We also have to include the cost of transactions while we're talking about profits. I do agree that these are minimal costs, but when talking about large turnovers, this is going to affect our performance and portfolio management results to a great deal. Now, these passive strategies also, let us talk about index funds, in which mutual funds are designed to duplicate the performance of stock market index, the stock market index, any stock market index, on which that index fund is based on. And I did mention, remember, it could be based on the Karachi Stock Exchange Index, the Lahore Stock Exchange Index, or the Slamba Stock Exchange Index. We'll be talking about indices later. But for baat se baat nikalti aati hai, word se word nikalti aati hai, and you keep flowing from one subject to another, but we'll be talking about indices in due course of time. Now, a good thing about the passive investment in index funds is that no attempt is made to forecast market movements, and index funds act accordingly wherever the market is going. There is no attempt to select under or overvalued securities. And the advantage is there's low cost to operate and there's low turnover. But the bottom line is you go with the market. You just hitched on to the bandwagon. You just hitched on to the index. The index is doing well. Your fund is doing well. Obviously, you are doing well. If the index is going south, so is the asset management company's fund, 
and so are your finances. So an index funds makes you go north or go south depending on its direction. Not much has to be done in such an index fund except buy it and wait. You try to find out what a good opportunity is in the index and what would be a good opportunity to sell at the better level of the index. So this is one of the safest way people want to invest into the mutual funds by buying an index based fund. On the other hand, we have talked a while about passive strategies. How about talking about active stock strategies as for a change? Now an active stock strategy assumes that investors possess some advantage relative to other market participants. Remember, it is about knowledge of the market that is going to change strategies from passive stock strategies to active stock strategies based on understanding that maybe an individual has above average knowledge about the stocks. And then only will he or she be able to perform better than a person who's got relatively lesser knowledge about the market. Now, most investors do favor this approach despite evidence about efficient markets. Another word has come up. First, it was indices, now it's efficient market, and we'll be talking about efficient markets as well. Efficient markets need to be understood. And we need to understand this approach, why investors favor this approach, despite the good things about the efficient market and the bad things about efficient markets. Because these efficient markets vary from market to market, from emerged markets to emerging markets. In active stock strategies, we need to have identification of individual stocks as offering superior return risk trade-off. And then selections can be part of a diversified portfolio. But here, if you active portfolio management, ki baat kare, yeah, active stock strategy ki baat kare, to hum buy and hold ki strategy itni zyada nahi zen mein rakh rahe, but we're talking about trying to identify individual stocks because of our extra knowledge about the stock markets or our extra abilities to read the balance sheets and then decide what stocks to invest into instead of going into mutual fund directly, we could make our own mutual fund. We could make our own portfolio without being dependent and without being able to rely on an asset management company. You can do this. You can be your asset manager. You can make your own asset. You can make your own portfolio. You can manage it yourself. If you've got the expertise, the knowledge, you can buy and sell. Please keep in mind, all this buying and sell is going to entail charge. The more you buy and sell, the more actively you are in the market, the more commissions you're paying, and then you're more exposed to all the vagaries of the weathers of the stock market. Now, while we're talking about active stock strategies, we're actually talking about investment advice geared to selection of stocks, individual stocks, like we have in XYZ investment survey, or an ABC investment survey in which you can find out where people are putting in good money and where bad money is coming out from or vice versa. Here is the security analyst's job to forecast stock market returns. So either you could be your own financial analyst or take help from a financial analyst for which you again have to pay a cost. You could subscribe to a financial analyst journal. You could subscribe to issues that would help get you a good information to base your information decisions on. Now these estimates provided by analysts can be of help to you. Any expected change of earnings, any expected return on equity, the change in industry outlook from positive to negative and vice versa, and then you could look at recommendations whether to buy a share, sell a share, or just hold on to. This holding on to strategy is another very debatable word 
which has got its own meanings. How do you hold on to a script? Either you buy a share or you sell it. What do you do while you're holding on to one share? Just wait on the sidelines and let the market take its course and for you to find out whether you made a good decision or bad. So sometimes people only talk of buying and selling and not holding. But then when you buy for the long term, you have to hold on to the stock. But in active stock strategies, you technically just buy and sell, you don't hold on. In a passive stock strategy, you buy and hold. And you sell the hold then. So in active strategies, it's basically buy, sell. In passive strategies, buy, hold, and sell. In active strategies, you are dependent on market forces. In active stock strategies, you're dependent on your abilities and decision-making powers, or you're dependent on financial analysis, research available to you, free or paid. But you make a superior decision, or you think you'll be able to make a superior decision compared to the rest of the market. You'll be able to make a decision that is going to give you better returns than normal market returns. Plus the fact that these active stock strategies need to be looked at minutely by individuals. While doing active stock strategies, you could maybe talk of sectoral rotation or industry rotation. Swapping from one sector to another sector, the same way you do stock selection. In stock selection, you select stocks. In sector selection, it involves shifting sector weights in the portfolio. And shifting sector weights means you put in more shares of one sector, lesser of another sector, based on your financial statement analysis of the industry as a whole. The benefits from sectors are expected to perform relatively well. And de-emphasized sectors expected to perform poorly, meaning what? taking out sectors that they are underperforming and put in more sectors that are overperforming or outperforming the market. At any one given time, not all sectors will perform badly or not all sectors will perform well. So some, be some sectors are performing the other sectors. So generally speaking, you'll be putting in sectors and we would maybe talk about four sectors broadly, which would include maybe interest-sensitive stocks, consumer durable stocks, capital goods stocks, and defensive stocks. So interest-sensitive stocks, consumer durable stocks, capital goods stocks, and uh, defensive stocks would be the four broad categories of stocks. These sectors will behave separately at any given time, but out of these, a defensive sector would be the best, the safest. Why would that be? The reason would be, and we've talked about this at length, a defensive stock would be immune from whatever is happening around in the general economic scenarios, plus the fact general economies do not bother defensive stocks. Or you could a blend of four sectors, or you could just make one specific defensive stock sector investment, or maybe an interest sensitive stock sector, or a consumer durable, uh, consumer durable stock sector, or a capital goods stock sector. It all depends on where we are heading for, how much we are going to put us ourselves at risk, what is going to be the required rate of return what is going to be the expected growth in all these factors we're looking into, and then we're looking at the time period in which we're going to see all this. Which then takes us to another very important segment of the market, and that is timing. It is all about timings. When to invest and when to disinvest. When to buy, when to redeem. So this is important. Market timings. You don't keep your head in. You don't keep your hands inside the stock market all the time. You sometimes have to wait on the sidelines. You need to buy at times. You need to sell at times. 
can't have you have to move both ways and it's the market timings that's going to decide all this. So market timers attempt to earn excess returns by varying the percentage of portfolio assets in equity securities. It is the timings that you make earn more or less. And you increase portfolio betas when the market is expected to rise. It is paramount to understand. Success would then depend on the amount of brokerage commissions and taxes paid. Can investors regularly time the market to provide positive risk-adjusted returns? The answer could be yes, and then the answer could be no. Would depend on an individual's capacity to understand the stock market. This entire subject, this entire process we've been going through, is focused and aimed at all this, trying to be above average investor knowledge base. For people to be able to understand the stock market and be able to make regular, uh, they be able to regularly time the market to provide positive risk adjusted returns. We need to understand the betas. We need to understand the required rate of returns. We need to understand discounted cash flows. And we need to be able to have a good estimate about hitting the estimates right, what the future earning per shares are going to be, and what is the price earning multiple going to be. It's timing. Anybody can buy shares having the money to, you know, buy the shares. It's not only about buying. It's also about selling. So we must understand when we're getting into a buy and hold and sell strategy while we're talking about passive stock strategies, or we are going into an active stock strategy of buying and selling, it all depends on timings. Now, while we're talking about all this, we need yet to talk about betas, we need yet to talk about market efficiency or the efficient market hypothesis. And we need to be discussing all that, but that's for later. We also need to be talking about indices because that's going to be the thing that we'll be able to benchmark our performances. But for now, we've got to talk about what strategies have we looked at. What are the alternative investments that we looked at? So we could either be going into for direct investments by buying directly from the company through an IPO or an offer for sale or trading directly in the stock market through a broker. But then we could also be talking about indirect investments and using an intermediary for all our investments. So we could be going to a bank and investing or we could go to a mutual fund to invest and get returns. But remember, we talked about mutual funds and we talked about close-end mutual funds and open-ended mutual funds in which close-ended mutual funds would be having a fixed paid-up capital, a fixed authorized capital, and then they are traded on the stock exchange. Or we could go for an open-ended mutual fund in which the capitalization constantly keeps changing because you have redemptions of units of mutual funds and you have people buying in units of mutual funds. Remember, we're talking about units as in mutual fund and shares as in companies. So you can either redeem or buy shares directly from the company in an open-ended fund which is not traded on the stock exchange. Only Closed-ended mutual funds are traded on the stock exchange. The open-ended fund is another opportunity because this saves you from any exposure to risk because you are perhaps not so uh, inclined to be able to make decisions based on your knowledge and let the asset managers, let the professionals handle your investment decisions so that you get better risk-free environment and maybe minimize your losses and 
maximize your profit. So indirectly investing is not a bad idea at all. Once you get the feel and understanding of the market, that's all for now. Thank you very much.